Hi everyone, it's Joe here from Lawn Solutions Australia and welcome to this episode of Turf Talk where I'm joined by my colleague Nathan. Nathan, welcome. Thanks for having me, Joe. And excited. We're, um, we're always excited. Another we're, episode. Another episode. We're, we're taking a different a different tact uh, for this episode and a couple of episodes coming up. What's the plan? What we wanted to do was focus in on each of the turf varieties that we specifically supply. And by turf varieties, I mean the actual species of grasses. Mm-hmm. So buffalo, kaiku, zoysia, cooch. We'll just go into the, the characteristics of each and a little bit about each one. And That's right. So we're going to do a dedicated episode to each of the grasses and we're going to start off with uh, buffalo grass. Okay. Um, buffaloes in Australia are the most popular residential lawns by a margin. Um, they're probably, in the residential market over the past 20 years, they're probably 70, 75% of sales, different types of buffalo. It's funny though because in other parts of the world, they're not as common. I mean, because they're a warm season grass, you wouldn't see them in Europe, for example. Uh, buff, soft like buffalo grass would be very, very rare. You see them a fair bit in the US, actually, though. We've been there a couple of times now, but they're not called buffalo grass. They're called St. Augustines in the US. Um, buffalo grass refers to a totally different type of grass in the US, which we've got in trouble a little bit before. But um, it's native, funnily enough, to the areas of North and South America, parts of Af- Africa and also the Caribbean. Um, but it's not native to Australia. It was imported, and it's commonly known as, as softleaf buffalo. But I guess what it's such a popular grass in the Australian backyard, front yard. What makes it so popular? I guess it's just how versatile they are. They're, they're very low maintenance in regards to being able to um, tolerate, you know, inconsistent maintenance as far as mowing and things like that. They're quite drought tolerant for a species. Uh, their shade tolerance level is generally, you know, the the best for sure shade tolerance so they can be installed in a range of areas and it gives you a grass that basically uh is sort of a a one-stop shop for anyone that's just looking for grass they don't want to be too fastidious about it but they're after something it's going to be easy to look after it's no fuss it's It's easy to do grows in the shade doesn't invade gardens it's a it's a popular type but i know we spend a lot of time in the u.s and they kind of think it's Except for everyone that's in Florida, because it's pretty popular in Florida. Everyone thinks we're weird uh, for, <laughs> for liking softleaf buffaloes or some Augustine grasses, because they're quite coarse, and our our American friends um, like the fine leaf look. This is why zoysia grass is so popular over there. And I know up until recently, we used to look at them and say, "How come you like zoysia grass so much?" And they look at us and say, "How come you like buffalo grass so much?" But they've changed a lot. I know if you talk to some. Some elder statesmen around the place, they always go, oh, buffalo grass, that's that horrible, old, scratchy, yucky stuff. But it's changed a lot uh, over the years. I know the old style Sydney buffalo, if you look at a microscopic image of a leaf, it's almost like it's got razor blades on the leaf. Kids used to be really uh, allergic to it. It used to scratch skin. It used to be horrible. But these newer types of soft leaf buffaloes, as we call them, um, popular on being Sawalda DNA certified and uh, there's others out there but they're they're beautiful and soft to touch they're low allergenic they're, they're great grasses they've changed a lot um, just just a, a bit of a history of some names uh, that people might be familiar with those that have known or been in the industry for a while would have grown installed or looked after the old ST varieties uh, there was ST85 there was ST91 uh, there was a bunch of different ones and they were sort of the the link between the older school scratchy buffalo varieties and then the new softleaf buffaloes we see today like Sawalda, uh, for example so you would be familiar with a lot of those um but that, like, like Nate said before, they were, they're mainly here for shade tolerance uh, and that's probably the key characteristics of them. Um, I guess the, morpho- the morphological characteristics, the morphology of buffalo grass, um, how is it generally grown? How is it planted? How do they start a buffalo crop? So on the farm, buffalo grass is a bit different to other warm season grasses in that they they are grown from solid plant material, vegetative plant materials or stolons. The the farms are, have to plant those on on the paddock, and then yeah, essentially it grows from, grows from there into into solid turf once it's fully established. They then leave ribbons on the ground, ribbons of buffalo grass um, during the harvesting process so that there is material, plant material within the ground. They're ready to go for it to grow back over um, and become available as a harvestable crop again. People might have seen this when they're driving past turf farms and they'll see some paddocks that are totally cut out bare and some that basically have strips of grass. Those are the ribbons Nathan's referring to um, along the paddock. And I guess without stealing your thunder here, Nathan, I guess I guess the main reason they, they have them there is 
Buffalo grasses don't have a strong rhizome. So there's two different types of grass roots. There's stolons and rhizomes. Stolons are, are runners, essentially. They creep along the ground, which buffalo has a strong a strong stolon. And there's rhizomes, which are, grow underground, and that's why kaikyu and cooch and those grasses pop up in your garden beds because they've got rhizomes. Buffalo grasses don't have a strong rhizome, so they've got to leave ribbons in the ground to have some material to regenerate uh, the farm from. So that's why you generally won't see buffalo grasses on sporting fields and other high where situations just because not just because of the coarse leaf it's because of the lack of rhizome as well so they don't really come back but whilst that can be seen sometimes as a negative it's also a positive when you're talking so water around garden beds and that sort of thing because the rhizome won't creep under the garden bed and grow into the grass it's just a matter of whippersnipping and looking after it which leads to which leads to its low maintenance but it is a warm season grass but you can grow it all year round in australia pretty effectively people lay it all year round in australia pretty effectively what will it do in most areas over the winter it'll definitely go into a certain level of dormancy depending on on where your where your climate is and and the extent of winter for you it's going to lose a little bit of color and it's going to slow down it's not a massive issue for us in australia it's, it's, i guess that's one of the other reasons why it really works well in our climate is that it's just so versatile it, it will handle the winter conditions harsh winter conditions but it'll bounce it back again in spring so it's, it's not really a concern in our situation it still holds quite good color it, um, especially if you're in a, a metro area a built-up area where it's not flat exposed you've got a bit of protection from tree and shade trees and shade and buildings and that sort of stuff it'll it'll hold good color that's right but yeah the the, the way that it grows obviously it's really easy to manage from a, a keeping on top of it and keeping it out of your garden beds perspective because it only has those above ground runners mm-hmm. um we get this question quite a lot how do i've got buffaloes you know creeping into you know my lawn or whatever it is and yeah. it's, it's surprising how many people don't realize it's really easy to get rid of whilst it might be growing really well throughout the warm season and spreading those runners across the surface which is great obviously from a turf production perspective as well um, it's just a matter of edging regularly and yep. cutting off those runners and you'll keep on top of it. So um, from that perspective, it's, it makes it a, another sort of easy to maintain grass for and, sure. And whilst it doesn't have a rhizome, so it doesn't have quite the wearability of what a kuchu or a kaikyu do, it, start, it still does self-repair. Um, those stolons can creep along the ground pretty fast when people want them to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I guess the hero trait of it, um, if we're going to talk about the way it grows, is its shade tolerance. And you touched on that before. We like you see different facts and figures everywhere about buffalo grass and how it should be in the shade. Whether people characterise them by percentages, or it can handle seventy five percent shade, or by hours of sunlight. But like everyone says something different. But I think if you're getting sort of two to three, three to four hours of direct sunlight a day, your soft leaf buffalo is going to handle that. Um, when you're talking cooch and kikes, you're going to more towards six, seven hours or full sun. When it comes to shade, even with buffalo grass. Those lower levels of sunlight, so the two to three hour level, that's going to be with no wear. You can't have shade and wear because it'll hurt even a buffalo grass. But if you're getting low levels of light and you want a grass to work, if buffalo doesn't work, you're putting something else in an alternative service pretty well, aren't you? It is the most shade time you have. And so that's direct sunlight. So you, you, yeah. if you're getting, you know, two to three hours of dappled sunlight, I think you're going to struggle with buffalo. You're going to struggle with any grass, really. Mm. Grass needs, you know, sunlight to photosynthesize. It needs it needs sunlight to grow and, and survive. So you're looking at sort of, yeah, like Joe said, a bare minimum of three to four hours of direct sunlight, mm. um, and it's definitely your best option if shade is a factor in, in your area. I you use big words. So if you're, if you're not sure how much sunlight your area actually gets, and we – tell these people this trick all the time this is not just for buffalo but for any grass a good thing you can do is on a on a sunny day not on a cloudy day because it won't do you much help but if you go out there on a sunny day at 10 o'clock 12 o'clock 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock and just take a photo of your lawn that'll give any turf farmer or any turf professional pretty and yourself a pretty good idea of how much sunlight your lawn actually gets the problem is people go out there in the middle of the day and go, oh yeah, it's full sun yeah, it's because the sun's in the middle of the sky of course it's going to be full sun but if you go to a few different times a day you'll get a pretty good on understanding of how of how much sunlight your yard actually gets and if you're looking to put some soft leaf buffalo in you've done your work and you see you got a bit of shade and you want a low maintenance lawn so you want to put soil or dna certified in for example a couple of points to installing this stuff successfully what would we be advising customers uh, in order to get a good looking soil lawn at the start at the start it's 
pretty simple. It's basically a matter of making sure you get a good soil preparation done so you've got a nice depth of quality sandy loam soil, something that's going to make it easy for the roots of the Sawalta grass or buffalo grass to spread down into the soil and, and giving it enough moisture and hydration and water during that period and provided you've got that minimum level of sunlight that you need for a buffalo grass to survive, uh, it's going to thrive. It'll kick on really well. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's sort of that no-fuss grass and it definitely counts in that regard when it comes to installation as well because it's quite straightforward and it's just a matter of making sure it's got those those key things that it needs, good soil, good rain yes. um, or irrigation and sunlight. The, the one thing I'll say is if you're laying soil water is just, just to really make sure it's established before you go ahead and mow it. Uh, if you're going to put in, a lot of people see, you know, some really light root initiation so they get the mower out straight away and they – and they cut it right back and they wonder why it's struggling so much. With cooch grasses and that, you can do that. But with buffalo grass, because it probably is a, a slightly slower growing grass, you've got to really let it establish first and then you can get the mower out and gradually bring it down over time. Um, they do, like, they can thatch up a little bit, but they're nowhere near as bad as what the cooch grasses and that are. So I'm um, just talking of thatch, a lot of people might not know this, but the grass Sawalta. Uh, so Walter is actually an acronym for winter active, low thatch and environmentally responsible. So it does produce a lot less thatch than what the older buffaloes do, but we do tell people just to wait that little bit longer before you're mowing them. It's not going to thatch up quickly like a cooch grass does, so you can get away with it. But it's a lot more forgiving. Yeah, mm -hmm. that first mow, obviously you want to get it get it in nice and early, and depending on the time of year, it's probably around four to six weeks for a buffalo lawn, so it's not as early as a cooch grass or a faster-growing faster, faster growing grass. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, you just want to do that first mow. Just knock the top off it, um, not not too much. A third of the leaf is the general guide or the, the golden rule. Yep. And and um and go from there and get get into regular mowing, but you certainly want to keep it a little bit higher. Buffalo doesn't like to be as low as the fine leaf varieties. Mm -hmm. um, you, you want it, you know, at least around that sort of, generally speaking, forty to sixty mil area. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about mowing now. We like, I know, sort of five ten years ago, we people didn't ask a lot about mowing. They had more questions about the grass. But as we get into this new age of cylinder mowers and and lawn fanatics and those type of people. How do I mow or what mower I get is a really, really common question and it's one we get often with, with buffalo grass. So as Nath mentioned before, it, it has some pretty good versatility when it comes to mowing. You can't take it as low as the other varieties, uh, as you just said, but if you go down to, say, 20 mil as a minimum and 60 mil as a maximum, you can have a good-looking buffalo lawn on a range of different heights. Now, the majority of people that own a buffalo lawn will have just a rotary mower, whether that's an electric, whether that's a battery, whether that's a petrol mower um, the main thing with any of these mowers is just to constantly check your blades and make sure you have sharp blades if you've got sharp blades you can make a buffalo lawn look really really nice uh, yeah for sure just with a rotary mower you see many with cylinders oh, we see a few with cylinders they generally are cut a little bit lower with the cylinders because they obviously go a little bit lower so down to oh we've seen as low as sort of eight mil and yeah. around that sort of area they can look great but there's a lot more uh, involved and a lot more inputs required in order to get a buffalo grass to perform at a high level um, yeah. below that sort of 20 mil area certainly doable don't recommend it for most people yeah. uh, if you're looking for something that's low maintenance not going to require as much water or inputs you really want to stick to more around that 40 to 50 mil sort of yeah. um, area for sure but yeah people can definitely get a cylinder mower on it you some, sometimes you have to uh, adjust the settings on it or have it modified or there might be a specific cylinder mower that can get go go a little bit higher for you with the buffalo because because yeah. generally they'll be aiming or their preset cut heights will be generally a little bit lower mm -hmm. uh, for cooch lawns and things like that so um, that's one thing you'll need to consider if you did want to get a cylinder mower um, is that you you want to make sure that it's going to be able to cut it um, high enough what i've seen a lot of lately and they're mainly used on buffalo lawns i saw one the other day at, at a turf farm in sydney that i was at is People are getting really good results out of rotary mowers with the rollers on the back. I don't know if you've. you've it's an interesting thing. I've seen. I've seen a few people. People, I think, uh, get I, them for Christmas and things like that because they're taking. They're going from that entry level sort of lawn homeowner trying to take their lawn to that next level, and then instead of spending thousands of dollars on a cylinder mower, they might strap a few hundred dollar roller onto the back of a rotary or the rotary. Some of them have them. Um, I'm, they, a, I'm a converted. They so do quite good. They do the job. They I was like job. looking at it first, going, like, just you know, either get a cylinder mower or you don't, sort of thing. But yeah. I don't. We don't really mention brand names here um, too much. But was, I, I know there's a, a company called WeBang. There's a company, uh, obviously Massport and Honda all do them. But I was looking at one the other day. Um, it's actually the WeBang one, and the quality of the cut was so good. It honestly looked like a cylinder mower had mown it. But with buffalo grass. Um, 
you can just keep it at that natural sort of height, that erosion mows it, and you can actually cut stripes into your lawn too, and they're not much maintenance. But obviously, they're not going to get the finish that a cylinder mower is going to get because you don't have the scissor action with the blades. That's but it. But they'll certainly, they'll if you've got, got enough weight in them and they've got the roller, they're going to they're gonna stripe up if, if it's able to push the push the grass down in opposite directions. Now, now with Buffalo, the, the other main question we get with mowing is, do I mulch or do I catch my clippings? And I don't know. At the, at the end of the day, you can do both. I know if you're on a larger area and you've got a right on mower, you're, you're mulching anyway or you're, or you're leaving the clippings on the lawn. But you, you can do both with a push mower as well. The only thing I would suggest is if you're going to mulch, don't do it all the time. Throw the catcher on every so often because I think if you mulch too much over time, you will start to build up a fair bit of thatch in buffalo lawns. They will get quite spongy. So as long as every so often you remove the clippings and probably cut it a, a notch or two lower, you can get away with mulch mowing. Especially if you're having to mow frequently like at least weekly throughout that spring and summer period yeah if you if you drop dropping clip into the profile you know up to twice a week over a couple of months period it's definitely going to build up a lot of a lot of dead um, grass mm-hmm. clip material in the mm-hmm. profile just and just a rule with mowing nathan did touch on it before but the shorter you cut your grass the more you have to do to keep it looking good you see people with beautifully manicured couch and your lawns at sort of 8 10 12 mil the amount of effort required, water, nutrient, and mowing to keep a lawn like that, looking like that, is really, really high. If you want a good-looking lawn but you don't want to put the effort into it, just keep it that little bit longer. Uh, and like I said, the longer the leaf, the less you have to do to keep it looking like it does. So mm-hmm. that's something definitely worth considering. And I guess with buffalo, you tell people to keep it longer heading into winter as well? Yeah, a little bit longer heading into winter. It's going to hold up better throughout that cooler period of the year. It's going to be less likely to get frost damage if you're in an area that's going to get a few frost through or radiation frost through that period. Um, But also in summer, it's it's the same sort of the flip side of it is you tend to cut your lawn or buffalo lawn a little bit shorter throughout the warmer months Mm -hmm. because it can handle it. You're mowing a lot more frequently. Um, But if you get really hot conditions, hot, dry conditions, you're actually better off, you know, raising the height a notch again in the the hottest period of the year as Mm -hmm. well. It's not just winter so if you get it in its perfect sweet spot you might want to just leave it at the same height all year round um, if that's a touch higher and then then it'll probably enjoy that as well so it really depends on the conditions you're experiencing and just as we as you sort of come into winter and oh, through autumn and into winter and you're thinking about putting the mower away for a while i can't stress enough the importance of sort of keeping it half out of the shed um it's it's an important thing particularly the late parts of autumn if you've got deciduous trees around your grass may not be growing but it's really important to try and keep your lawn tidy Um, The reason I say that is if you leave too much debris and other material like leaves on your lawn, you will block the lawn's ability to absorb sunlight and and photosynthesize. (laughs) But it's really important just to keep it half out and just to keep it tidy. Raise your cut height for sure, but don't put the mower away totally. Even if your lawn has slowed right down in growth, it's nice to just keep it tidy. On to another part of maintenance um, with buffalo grass. We'll spend a little bit of time here because – Every grass now, with all these new varieties on the market, they all have different fertility and nutrient requirements. But buffalo is kind of the meat and potatoes when it comes to fertilizing. It's a pretty it standard program you can it follow is. and you can keep it looking good. Key times. When would you when would you feed your buffalo lawn? This goes for any lawn, but buffalo grass in particular, because it is so versatile. I keep saying versatile, but I think I just mean like it's basically it's a bit foolproof in that it, it's not it's not tedious. It's pretty straightforward. So fertilizing buffalo grass is quite simple. We generally recommend fertilizing once in spring, once in, again in summer, and again in autumn. Uh, good guide. Public holidays is a great way to remember uh, October long weekend in, in the states that have your October long weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, again near Australia Day in summer and again around easter long weekend so that's sort of your three most important fertilizer applications granular fertilizers that'll give you sort of longevity throughout the season of the growing months and also send it into winter nice and healthy so that's sort of the key key when it comes to buffalo with fertilizing you can fertilize it more you can look at using liquid fertilizers as to sort of complement your granular fertilizer with buffalo grass but most of the time you don't need to it'd be more on an as needs basis if you want to give your lawn um, a bit of a a bit of a spruce up bit of an increase in color Um, it's looking a bit dull it's had a bit of a knock around with lots of traffic and things like that maybe you want to give it a little bit of a quick foliar boost then a liquid fertilizer from time to time on on top of the granular is great but we like to keep it simple with buffalo grass definitely want to keep it simple so i I think it's as easy as water and mow regularly fertilize three times a year and you have most of it covered just with the fertilizer because we we operate nationally we have to generalize everything we say so always if you're in a certain location you can you can alter what we say slightly to suit where you are just 
reason I say that is with that spring fertilize, uh, October long weekend is the perfect time to fertilize as a general rule. But the main thing you have to worry about if you're in a cooler state or a cool area is don't fertilize until your lawn is out of dormancy and is growing. There's no point at all at fertilizing a dormant lawn. If it's really sort of starting to mosey along slowly, you can feed it and kick it into gear a little bit, but you have to see some growth uh, before you fertilize, either you're wa- otherwise you're wasting your time. And, and as always, when you feed your lawns, buffalo's no different. Um, always try and water it in after you apply your fertilizer, unless you're using a, a controlled release fertilizer that doesn't require it, but most of them do. And don't wait for rain. Um, have it in a controlled environment where you can control the amount of irrigation you put on because you get a rain forecast that says there's five coming and you'll get 20 or it'll say there's 20 and you'll get five. So it's, it's really important to control your, your irrigation after you fertilize. But with buffalo, like some of these new varieties, and we'll talk about them in the in the episodes when we get to them, but they don't like a lot of upfront nitrogen. It can actually cause some issues with disease and thatch production and that with them. So while is a lot less fussy, you can, you can hit it with a bit of urea if you want to spark it up color-wise. It's just going to need some more mowing or you can hit it with a high nitrogen fertilizer. But... With most general slow release granular ferts, if you stick to sort of two to two and a half kilos per hundred three times a year, you're going to have a healthy sawalda lawn. For sure. Yeah. Yep. And the best time to apply them to a buffalo lawn is after you mow. You don't want to apply the fertilizer and then mow because obviously you can pick up the granules uh, when you put them in. So mow first and then apply to the fertilizer and you'll have a pretty good looking lawn. And we mentioned mowing a little bit higher as you head into winter, but there's another cheating cheating way it's not a cheating way but it is a cheating way how you can keep your lawn green heading into winter um Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit of a, a product placement here, but um, with any warm season grass that loses a certain amount of colour throughout the winter period, a great option. Um, and, and you want to do it early is a pigment. Um, you want to get it down before it goes completely dormant, so the plant can still absorb absorb the pigment. But we have a product called Color Guard Plus. It's a great product. If your lawn loses colour in winter and you don't look, like the way that it that it looks, then Color Guard Plus is basically the solution for you. It, you spray it on your lawn and it's instantly green and it looks great and it's nice nice and easy to do for everyone so we, we recommend the use of it if it, it's purely cosmetic um for the most part it does also i guess the darker color will slightly increase the leaf temperature by a degree or two which can limit the effects of frost during that winter period mm. so that we have seen a lot of that on turf farms where they've, they've used color guard on paddocks and, well. and and the grass has actually held up a lot better throughout the winter period so there is a benefit there but for the most part if, if your biggest issue with a warm season grass in winter is that it loses color and you don't like the look of it then color guard plus is is the answer for that situation you didn't want to do a product placement and then said color Guard plus 22 times in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't help myself. That's no, good. It's a, it's a good product and people and people should use it. Go and buy Car Guard Plus now. Okay. Um, <laughs> so when weeds and pests, like I know we're recording this uh, in autumn, um, and I know grubs are a massive, massive problem now. So we'll we'll attend to them in a second, but let's start with weeds uh, in buffalo grasses. So Buffalo grasses, like a lot of warm season grasses, have a great natural resistance to weeds because they generally grow quite close and quite tight. And just as a rule, like the the more you fertilize and the more you mow and the healthier you keep your lawn, the thicker it's going to be and the better it's going to naturally choke weeds out. So that's just a rule number one. But the good thing with buffalo grass, um, I suppose, is you can spray it with almost anything uh, and it'll keep most weeds out but there is a bit of a no-no with the commonly used product when it comes to soft leaf buffalo you shouldn't be using weed and feed on them weed and feed dicamba anything with dicamba herbicide in them you want to avoid with buffalo grasses but other than that it's they're pretty good there's not many uh, herbicides that you can't really use on a buffalo grass at least selectively or spot treating anyway so if you have common broadleaf weeds like oxalis clover cudweed dandelion if you've got any of those in your lawn a broadleaf herbicide that's buffalo safe is the key so making sure it doesn't have dicamba in it generally you're looking for something that's bromoxynol based is the active constituent you're looking for uh, products like Bindi, all-purpose weed control, they're, they're the ones that you need to, to look for and, and make sure you're using those and not dicamber. Otherwise, you can, yeah, knock the buffalo around a little bit. And and it's an important thing to look at if you're, if you're not sure what you're, what you're looking for and you go into the shop, always look. And if it, if it says that word dicamber, do not spray it on your soft leaf buffalo lawn. And if you read the back of, say, Bindi or all-purpose weed control, which are perfectly safe for Sir Walter, they will say not to be used on ST varieties of buffalo. Uh, you'll see that quite quite regularly, and we'll get a lot of questions saying, oh, I can't spray this on my 
Sir Walter because it's a shade tolerant. It's an ST variety of buffalo. And the ST is referring to the older style buffalo, as we said before. There isn't a lot of people out there now that would have an ST buffalo lawn, like maybe no. some older houses I, would. I got this exact call about three hours ago. <laughs> so it comes up still. I guess obviously it's on the label, so it's, it's good that people are reading it and understanding to make sure that it's right for their grass first and foremost. Um, but this one I spoke to today, they installed it 15 years ago, so it's sort of in that area where it could be one of the yeah. newer varieties. It yeah. could, could not. Um, but, yeah, they were quite confident it was a Sawalter lawn, and, and in that case it was definitely safe to use on their lawn. But if you're not sure, it's been down longer than you can remember and you, you have no idea, It's you could always trial a very small test area, mm -hmm. um, wait a week or two, see how it goes, and if it if doesn't sh so show any signs of harm, then then you're probably right to go. Um, that's the, that's with, the key thing. With weeds, this is not just a Sawalter rule, but any rule. If they're manageable, always try and remove by hand and remove the entire root system. Only spray herbicide if you have to, uh, mm -hmm. if it's gotten out of hand and you really yeah. need to hit it. If we're talking other weeds, um, buffalo grass can be susceptible in the cool areas to winter grass because it does get a little bit open over the winter time, so winter grass can come in. The best method of getting rid of winter grass is by preventing them by using a pre-emergent herbicide like Oxifert, like Oxipro, uh, Oxifert Plus. There's a bunch of different ones out there, but if you want to stop winter grass, get your application in sort of early Feb into March because although you may not see them, they could have germinated. You just don't see them because you're still mowing regularly, so you, you keep cutting the top of them off and you can't see it. But I'd get your pre-emergent application out um, to stop winter grass because it's too hard to spray out of a Sir Walter lawn. And yeah. You can use winter grass killer on, on Sir Walter, but you might take some perseverance and repeated applications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it's it's a bit of a funny thing in the industry at the moment. It's gone from being winter grass to all year round grass, so yeah. it can, can pop up a bit earlier um, and st stick around into the warmer months as well. So um, key thing is, yeah, like Joe said, get the Oxifert or Oxifert Plus onto it nice and early and you'll, you'll go a long way to – yeah, eradicating it from your lawn. And just with grubs, uh, we're seeing a lot of grub activity at the moment. Softleaf buffalo lawns are susceptible, but they aren't as susceptible as what Cooch and Kaiku you are. We see a lot more Cooch and Kaiku lawns get hit than what we see buffalo lawns do, but they, it does happen, particularly with armyworm and black beetle. So, again, anything like this, the best way to avoid them is to prevent them by coming, by pre-emerging, uh, by using a preventative insecticide like a Celeprin GR or GrubGuard Ultimate. These products are really, really safe to use. They're an insecticide, but they're exempt from the poison schedule. So there's no PPE requirements at all for using a Celeprin GR or GrubGuard Ultimate. And the thing I will say that if you do have grubs, use a knockdown insecticide that has the active bifenthrin in it. Don't just chuck a Celeprin out. It's more of a preventative than it is a knockdown, so it's best to stick with that. The other main pests that we'll see with buffalo grass, and you see it in buffalo grasses often, if not more than you other cultivars too, and we've seen a lot this sort of summer period is disease. Now, humid environments breed disease, and I know buffalo grass we've seen a lot uh, come through. And normally you associate disease with shortcut lawns because they are more susceptible. That's why you see a lot of it in golf greens and on golf courses because they keep their grass so short and so well fed. But Buffalo is susceptible to in humidity. Um, same thing again, if you get disease, you've got to try and get a fungicide on it straight away or you can apply a preventative fungicide. The other thing you can do is, depending on the type of disease with buffalo, you can generally wait the disease out um, and it will grow out and it will repair itself naturally. But if you do see your roots starting to lose a little bit of colour, they look a bit damp and a, little, a bit dull and a bit discoloured, you probably have a disease, particularly if it's humid at the time, so it's good to get a fungicide mm. on it um, and, and treat it as soon as you can. Yeah, and because buffalo's got that broad leaf, it's a little bit easier to diagnose if you've got particular leaf-related lesions or, or, or spots. So if, you, if you've got grey leaf spot or those sort of diseases that are quite easy to see on the leaf, then that's a sign you, or to, it is, you have disease in your lawn. So um, yeah, obviously you want to treat it. And, and I think the key thing is the same with like fungicides, the same with herbicides. We always want we're always looking towards prevention first and foremost or, or looking at the reasons why these disease conditions have, have occurred in the first place. So if you can aerate the lawn and try and get that moisture to go away and go deeper, obviously you can't stop humidity. It's it's what's going to be present. But if you can try and dry out the lawn a little bit, if you can, if you've been, you know, if you've had the irrigation on still going and you've had plenty of rain, then, then turn the irrigation off for a little yep. while. Help the lawn dry out. You want to, want to look at ways to eliminate the reasons for the disease um, occurring in the first place 
because you can chuck a heap of fungicide at it, but if, mm. if you've still got the cause of the issue present and you're not doing anything to try and help it, it's just going to persevere and you're going to have to keep using the fungicide. So um, prevention and a cure, it's, it's sort of a combo and, and you'll see a lot more success. And, yeah, like Joe said, just wait it out sometimes. It's mm. just a matter of doing what you can um, and, and then, you know, trying to repair it and recover it once conditions are more favourable. No, it's great advice. Um, it can be a tricky thing disease, but I think you summarised it really well to say for people that might think they have those symptoms, they should be getting onto it um, pretty soon. So just to wrap all this up, um, I guess if you think buffalo grass is the right one for you uh, and you start to make a few phone calls, you realise there's a lot of buffalo grasses on the market. And buffalo, the genetics of buffalo are different to other grasses because whilst all these buffalo grasses are different, in the middle of spring or the middle of summer when everything's green and going well, the texture of them and the genetics of them or the genetic look of them is very, very similar. You can have 12 different buffalo grasses that are available on the market today and whilst they are all different, they'll all look pretty similar uh, when they're green and growing at the time of year, where zoysia grasses, are, this is why they breed a lot more zoysia grasses. They, some, are, you know, some are coarse, some are fine, some are fat skinny, different colour, some are bluey green, some are lime green, some are dark green. Buffaloes are all pretty similar, but if you want to look at a buffalo grass, um, the one that's been the market leader for the last 20 years is Sawalda DNA certified. And it, it's not just um, because it's a good grass to look after. It's a, a pretty low susceptibility to a lot of diseases and a lot of other things other buffalo grasses get. It's got good winter color. It's soft to touch. It's easy to look after. Uh, but it is has been the number one buffalo grass in Australia for the last two decades for, for a good reason. And I think it's ticked over... Is it 120 million square metres? Something like that. It's a pretty now. extraordinary number for the Australian market. It's, it's the, the most metres. popular turf grass, domestic turf grass per capita in the history of the world. Uh, so. Yeah, not just in Australia, per capita. So that's crazy crazy numbers. And there's a sort of there's a lot of reasons behind it. Obviously the traits of the grass, but also the assurances that are provided in and around it. Mm -hmm. It's got comes with a 10 year turf product warranty, which is unprecedented in the turf industry for, for other buffalo grasses. Um, but it also comes with you know, guarantees around surf certification and, and and genetic assurances, which which I'm not aware of that existing with other buffalo grasses in the market. And what what that basically means from a from a consumer perspective is that a, a turf farm might be selling you a buffalo grass, and they're saying it's one thing, but it could mm. be absolutely anything. There's no assurance to you as the customer that you are actually spending the money and getting the product that you, you're after. But there is with Sir Walter DNA certified, so I guess that's the key message here. If you're going to buy Sir Walter, make sure it's the DNA certified Sir Walter. Make sure it comes with the original breeder guarantee. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure, make sure it's coming from a Lawn Solutions Australia member because they're the only ones licensed, licensed and accredited to grow Sir Walter DNA certified in the Australian market. Yeah, spot on. You said a number of wonderful things there, but the first thing you said, the first time I've ever heard turf certification get called surf certification. So, <laughs> <laughs> so well done. We'll um, just fix that, fix that up in post. Then it won't make, make sense. Fix job. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. Um, just, just before we go again on, on buffalo grass, if you really want to check out a deep dive into the genetics and the breeding of it, we did a, a podcast episode Oh, well, a couple of months ago now, uh, mid-23, with Dr. Ambika Chandra. And Dr. Chandra is the leader uh, in buffalo grass research and development in the world. She, she works out at Texas A&M. And I've never met someone in my life who is so good at explaining technical things simply and simplifying it so that everyone can understand and, and walk away feeling like a turf expert. So there's a lot going on in the buffalo breeding world at the moment. Just a, a little bit of a sneak peek. Lawn Solutions is heavily involved in it. And there could be a new buffalo grass on the horizon soon, which is showing some wonderful characteristics over and above the wonderful turf grasses that are already on the market. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, I'd check out that, that episode with Dr. Ambika. She's she's unreal. And uh, just keep your eyes peeled for what's what's coming uh, on the horizon soon with Lawn Solutions and new buffalo grass. It's pretty exciting, yeah. Pretty exciting. Um, if you want to learn more about Sawalda, you can always jump on our website and take a look. But Otherwise, um, I think we've covered that uh, in a bit of detail today. Yeah. Um, if you if you're not if you're not sure if it's the right grass to you, um, feel free to give Lawn Solutions a call or or go on our website and pop in your postcode and look for your local Lawn Solutions member and give them a call or head down the road and go and see them. A lot of them actually have turf plots um, at their office, so you can go and touch and feel and compare uh, the different grasses that are there. But um, I hope you enjoyed a, a bit of a dive or a bit of take on something different and looking at this turf grass. In the uh, buffalo grass? In the or, buffalo grass. Um, what do we say? Stenotaphrum second date uh, hey, in uh, St. Augustine. Hey, we, didn't, we didn't cover that. We had to get the scientific name uh, in, in, in there somewhere. Uh, we're not scientists, but uh, <laughs> every time we, um, we get together with our staff here, it's always 
one of the questions in the trivia is what is the tie the scientific name for Sir Walter or for Buffalo Grass and a Sten attack from second datum for those that are wondering. And, um, I didn't read that, I knew it off by heart. So <laughs> genius. Um Anyway, um, keep it, keep an eye out, keep an ear out for our next few episodes where we're going to uh, some different warm season grasses like like zoysia, like cooch. Um, and these are a lot newer uh, and they've got a lot more going on with them probably than buffalo grass does. So we're going to take a different tact uh, when we have a have a look at them. But otherwise, um, if anyone has any suggestions of people they'd like to hear on the podcast or think they might themselves might be worthy of getting interviewed on the podcast, please reach out to us here at Lawn Solutions. You can get in touch with us via phone, email, or jump on one of our socials and you'll be able to get in touch with us there. But we're always looking for new and exciting people to talk to or topics to talk about. And thanks to the people that have already reached out. We do see the comments and we'll be in touch with you all in, in due course. Thanks for tuning in. Good to catch up again, Nate. Thanks, Joe. And um, we'll see you all on here next time. Thanks. <laughs>